well, how the Terraform works under the hood. Uh, this will be the presentation we based on the Azure RM provider, uh, as as I am working mostly with the Azure Cloud, this is the one I'm most familiar with. But I tried to keep the uh, level of the presentation, at least from the cloud perspective, to be as much cloud agnostic as possible. With just some, of course, we cannot totally skip the part about uh, it being something related to Azure, but I think based on the examples that I have prepared to show you, you will be able also to uh, somehow collab collaborate this on the level of another cloud as well. Uh, so for the beginning, short introduction about me. So well, my name is Michal. I am a tech lead in SoftServe uh, since one year ago. Uh, I have over 10 years of experience as IT engineer. Uh, previously working more as a software engineer with web applications using the C Sharp and .NET environment. Uh, and of course, Azure Cloud, which at some point moved into the, was a smooth transition for me into the uh, Azure DevOps position. Uh, I am certified by Microsoft. And I have multiple certifications. I also have HashiCorp Terraform Associate, uh, which is most related to what we'll be talking about. Uh, and there are also some other certifications that uh, are also pretty interesting, but probably not from the perspective of this specific uh, presentation. Uh, and maybe just uh, one small word about my department. So basically I am from the DevOps practice, uh, one of the also newest departments. I think newest, but it's basically over one and a half year old uh, right at the moment. Um, so basically we are uh, gathering uh, DevOps from different countries, uh, preparing some kind of programs for growth of them. Uh, and we are trying to also to work properly with the demand that the customers come for us. Uh, we are trying to somehow scale how we can uh, split our DevOps resources or employees between different projects. Uh, and uh, we are trying also to offer something that is uh, highlighted as the DevOps as a service. When you basically come to us, ask for a DevOps for, I don't know, one week, one, one month, and we can also provide you without, you know, having the whole big, uh, well, paperwork related to that. Uh, okay, so that's from the introduction part. Uh, I would not, now would like to go in a little bit into details about the Terraform before we will go to the main topics, just a short reminder what the Terraform is about. So Terraform is basically the infra as a code solution uh, where basically we are preparing some kind of code definition. Uh, we have something similar in Azure for uh, called Azure Resource Manager templates, ARM templates and also BICEP. And the Terraform is the more cloud agnostic solution uh, for this kind of, uh, this kind of tooling, uh, which is basically based on uh, on providers. Uh, you can have multiple different providers for each cloud for also other resources that are not exactly the cloud providers, but for example, some specific uh, specific uh, third party solutions, like for example, Databricks. Uh, and basically we are writing the code using, well, the, the, the plain text uh, with some specific formatting. This, this specific one for Terraform, Terraform has its own language in which you need to write down the definitions of what you want to achieve. Uh, then we are running the Terraform execution and basically Terraform starts to uh, create all the resources, but also verifies if the resources already exist and offers us the possibility to also monitor the state of the resources. So basically if we have already deployed something previously and we keep the so-called state file somewhere in one of the ways that Terraform supports, we are able to verify later on if the same uh, same uh, state is still uh, still proper, if we want need to update it or perhaps it was changed by someone else uh, outside the Terraform and then we can uh, readjust it back to the definition that we have, which helps us with the with skipping the infrastructure drift which basically means that the definitions that we have are not uh, not the same as what we have on the environment itself. Uh, in high level, how does the Terraform work? So we have the three main parts. Uh, while us usually we are focusing on the only on the blue ones, so the Terraform modules, uh, as this is the part that we maintain by ourselves. Usually, this is the only part where we are writing. Uh, but from each of those Terraform files, we are usually also uh, referencing the specific provider. So for example, in the case you have here, uh, there are two providers in the Terraform provider registry. 
uh, called Azure RM and Azure AD, the second one responsible mostly for the Active Directory related stuff. Uh, and of course, uh, our modules that we prepare by ourselves are uh, relying on the implementation that happens under the hood in that Terraform provider uh, that we are using. Then of course, we have also the cloud uh, that we use is Azure, AWS, GCP, other cloud providers or third party solutions like Snowflakes, Databricks, for example. Uh, usually what Terraform does uh, in this case is uh, basically have, be, being a wrapper for the API that is being exposed by those specific providers. Uh, and it's responsible for automating all the different calls uh, that both read and write the information about what is the state of the of the whole solution, the cloud resources that we want to achieve. Uh, and then, of course, the third parts of the Terraform provider registry. So we are mostly using it, but that's not, on, not only the case because we can also maintain it. And here we go to the main topic of the presentation. Uh, so the scenario I had uh, some time ago in one of my projects was that we had uh, some specific Terraform module that uh, we were using, uh, and we wanted to go with uh, it for the customer's implementation. Customer wanted to have everything automated, to not have anything done manually, or using the, even if using the scripts was not the best solution for them. Uh, so basically we wanted to go with Terraform module for all the specific uh, sub resources or sub third party solutions that we're using as part of the main solution. Uh, and there was one issue. The issue was basically that we used the proper Terraform provider that was available on the, uh, on the market, on the, on the library of uh, Terraform modules. But unfortunately, one of the things that we wanted to do, it was something related to role assignment. Uh, for the users was not working properly. And as it, as it turned out, we were we faced the very specific issue that uh, was, uh, was the broker for us because we were not able to properly provide the solution for the customer. Um, and we started working on some kind of workarounds to go over it. But uh, as it turned out, the issue was relatively easy to solve not with the, you know, with workarounds writing quite a lot of scripts. So basically we could also just go directly to the, uh, to the provider code and maybe provide the pull request, which would solve that issue. Uh, the issue was in the, because this, every, every, most of the uh, providers that HashiCorp provides, uh, the HashiCorp is the company that owns the Terraform. Uh, the HashiCorp provides all of its of their providers uh, on the GitHub. So it's very easy to just go find the issue if it already exists or create one if it does not exist yet. And basically uh, start uh, contributing by fixing the issue by ourselves. And actually as the issue was relatively, as, as I said, small, I decided that, hey, let's, let's maybe go this way. Let's maybe try to, uh, fix the code on the provider level instead of writing a very big workaround to, to fix small issue. Um, and that was the approach we, we have decided to go with. But uh, there is a one, one question. Does anybody of you even wrote uh, the Terraform provider yourself or maintain one? Because I did not. And for me, this was one of the first experience in this, in this area. And this is actually what I wanted to uh, share with you. So first of all, some details about the providers, how they are being written. Uh, so first, the Terraform providers are actually written in the Go language. And basically, uh, the language is specific. It's not, uh, it's not Python, which is very you know, easy to read. Uh, it's not some, some more as well. Some people may kill me for what I'm saying right now. It's not that much established uh, in the, I would say, older programmers' uh, backgrounds because uh, the Go is a relatively new language, uh, relatively because it's about five to seven years, I, I think, at the moment. Um, but finding someone, especially in the DevOps area, who has experience in Go is not that easy, easy feat to, to have. Uh, but of course, if you have some, if you have some code, and you know, if you have any idea how to work with already existing code, you probably are able to, at least to some degree, uh, run the code and modify it a little bit. Especially with the support of the uh, the, the IDEs, which would be able to to help you with the 
uh, with writing the proper code and compiling it. Uh, so we need to write the Go, uh, write it in Go language. Uh, if we want to use the custom provider, because at this point we are no longer using the defined one that is available by the HashiCorp or any third party vendors, uh, we also need to properly set up our pipelines to use that specific uh, version or in case of our local environment, which was used for testing if this, this specific implementation will work, we need to set up also some additional settings on our own, on our, our own environment. Uh, and from my personal recommendation, uh, when I started going into that, that uh, rabbit hole of uh, how the provider is being written, uh, I was really overwhelmed. Uh, so I suggest that if you even if you ever will have the need to write your own uh, provider, first go to some smaller one. Maybe maybe the one I will present right now, the Azure RM is not the best one because this is one of the largest available. Uh, but basically, go and see how other people wrote it before starting to go in for yourself, even with some tutorials. Uh, but yeah, for this presentation, we'll go through Azure RM just to, so we'll be able to uh, see how the bigger one works and also to see how, how to do small changes from perspective of uh, this specific provider. So first of all, uh, we need the repository itself, right? And HashiCorp fortunately provides us all, all of the uh, providers that they are they, they have and they are maintaining and the source code on the GitHub. So for this perspective, basically just Googling the Azure RM provider GitHub, and you should be able to go and find all the proper repositories. So for, for this purpose, I basically just uh, went there. Uh, I downloaded the repository by the clone, uh, git clone option. Uh, and fortunately, this specific one had some good documentation in terms of how, how to structure the, uh, the provider itself, which uh, for, at least from the HashiCorp perspective, this is very similar for all of the providers that they, they develop. Of course, this is not something that is a must have when you are writing your own or when you're working with the third party uh, providers, but um, it's very, very consistent. And I would say also a good practice in my opinion to also follow the same approach in this case. Uh, there are many folders. Uh, the more uh, important ones, I would say, um, there are the examples, which of course shows some kind of documentation how to run the specific uh, specific uh, comments or specific resources. Uh, there is the internal one. The, it's basically the part you see right now on the right side is the screenshot of the documentation, the part of it. Uh, it's not all of the of the resources that are there, but there is the internal uh, directory which co contains most of the business logic that is required to properly run the. Um, around the Terraform code. Uh, from our perspective, uh, the internal one has the common, the features. There is also um, one which is not available right now on the screen called services, which basically contains all the uh, different uh, resources available in the Azure. Uh, and this is where we will go a little bit further in the moment with the presentation. Uh, but most of it uh, already contains different different stuff that could be also used for by you. Um, one of the more important one from the ones that are listed here is the internals clients slash clients. Uh, so this one, uh, this is basically this basically calls all the wrappers for the Azure SDK uh, because this specific package is used Azure, Azure SDK for Go under the hood, and this is basically the client contains all the wrappers for the uh, APIs that are being called by the Azure SDK for Go. Uh, okay, so what do we need to properly run the, uh, the whole uh, provider? So first of all, of course, we need to Git to work properly with the repository to be able to commit to it, to fork it, to uh, be able to commit and push some changes. The second one is the Go SDK. So without the software development kit, we, we, were not, we won't be able to be able to work and compile the code. Uh, from the perspective of the providers that uh, HashiCorp uh, offers, there's also the GNU make. Uh, so basically the tool that is used for the compilation of the whole uh, tooling and also to, for, for running some tests and other, another stuff that is required from the perspective of 
preparing the final package of provider. Uh, and also one of the IDs with support for Go languages. So of course, there is nothing stopping everyone, anyone from writing it in the notepad or the Vim, especially Vim with some additional plugins will probably be enough. But uh, my personal recommendation would be to just use Visual Studio Code. Uh, there is good, good Go for Visual Studio Code extension that you can use. Uh, and also when you are working with it, I also would suggest installing the HashiCorp Terraform extension just for the purpose of um, just for the purpose of you know preparing some tests and running them properly uh, when you are working with some some of your new newly modified provider. Um, okay, and now what do we need to actually build it? So well, the first one is of course code clone to clone the whole repository to get it to your own PC, uh, and then the primary method of compiling it is to run the make build command. Uh, this takes about uh, five to 10 minutes to compile. Uh, and it basically prepares the whole uh, the whole provider and provide, provides it as the compiled binary file, which is then available in the, uh, well, the environment variable called gobuff slash go bin, uh, which basically by default is your root directory uh, dot go uh, bin directory available in your PC. Um, the whole the whole process, as I said, takes a little bit more. It starts from checking the formatting, uh, checking some kind of additional uh, running some additional tests. Then basically it generates all the all the files uh, for the for example services and provider as you can see on the screen on the right, uh, and then running some install. And then as you can see on the very bottom, uh, by by checking the, the the contents of the Go bean directory, you can see the Terraform provider Azure RM uh, binary that is available. Uh, there and now, if we have it already on our own PC, we would need to somehow reference it. So that's the next part that we need to take care of. Uh, and basically, this takes place here in the .terraform rc files available in your root directory. So uh, usually, that file does not exist. Um, you you have to create it, and Terraform will only then start. Uh, displaying the information that this kind of file is being used. So in this case, uh, you need to specify each provider that you are uh, overriding uh, with specific path that should be should be used. So for this example, you can see that I have the HashiCorp slash Azure RM uh, provider uh, set to be available in the in the um, absolute path of my uh, Go slash Bean uh, directory. Uh, so anytime I would try to use right now the Azure RM uh, provider on my Terraform code uh, on my local machine, it will provide me the information that, hey, you are using the override. Um, so then we can just you know write some very small part of the Terraform code just to verify if it works. Uh, the first of all, uh, an important part is that when we, we are running Terraform in it, uh, it will still download the proper version from the from the uh, third party repository. So in this case, uh, HashiCorp Azure RM version 3.0 has been loaded. But then I get the first warning that uh, there is a over development override available, and the HashiCorp slash Azure RM will be overridden by the uh, by the uh, one available in my home directory. Uh, and then, of course, next time when I will run Terraform apply, which is a command required for well, basically running the whole Terraform logic, I will get once again that information that the provider development overrides are in effect. So each time we are running any Terraform uh, comments that basically will go through the uh, go through the provider that we are using or that we have uh, required in our code, it will call each time and say, hey, just remember that we have that override in place and you are using some specific ver subversion that you have on your local machine instead of the proper one. This is very important, especially if you would like to, you know, if you have pre provided some kind of re uh, some kind of pull request, but in the meantime, you also wanted to have it working already on your own. So you adjusted your uh, Terraform agents to basically use the ones that you have created by yourself. So then, each time you will also see that kind of warning in the in the logs of your agent execution. 
Uh, okay, so first demo that I wanted to show you is basically going directly into Azure RM um, resource, uh, Terraform provider, and do some small change. Uh, so yeah, this is this is the uh, VS Code version of the Terraform provider Azure RM. Uh, this is loaded, I guess, one yeah when I was preparing this presentation, so I think it's a little bit out, out of date. But um, it's still rather rather fresh one, and and for this purpose, I wanted to go with the writing the additional message in the logs for the for the resource group resource. Uh, resource group is I would say the one of the most simple one. You can you can treat it as uh, the folder for all the other resources. Uh, and for this specific case, uh, as I mentioned, we we need to go to the internal and in the services you can see that we have quite a lot of different names. If you are not familiar with Azure, those are basically all the different resources that Azure provides uh, for themselves. So for example, we have here this storage account, which uh, storage, which could be called S3, for example, in AWS. So just to, you know, to have some kind of uh, example of what kind of stuff is there. And then we have the resource. So in this case, resource is the most uh, simple one. Uh, it contains some specific specific resources that are available. One of them is the resource group resource. And the naming convention is very nice here because the, the resource word uh, occurs much too many times in my opinion, but well, what can we do? Uh, and we have some simple part of the code. Uh, and for purpose of this specific presentation, I have uh, added uh, during the create update method, we have the additional log message uh, written, hello, soft serve from create update method live. And if I remember correctly, we also have the second one, hello, soft serve from read method. So this is a very simple, you know, just adding additional message that will just output us some kind of information about what's happening under the hood. Uh, of course, here we could also add some specific part of the code that is here. So for example, we have some client, et cetera, so we can get some more specific details, uh, which of course then we could append to that log value to just see what's happening. Uh, and then of course we can go with the make build, uh, which will basically run the whole uh, run the whole compilation. Unfortunately, as this is one of the biggest repositories from the a perspective of uh, Terraform providers. This one takes a little bit to compile, but for the purpose of the presentation, I already have it also compiled. So this, while this is still spinning, I will just show you the example of how this, this runs under the hood. Um, so yeah, so here we have a very simple one, uh, simple Terraform code called, uh, well, which basically just does one thing, creates a resource group called msmic example one in West Europe. Uh, it has the Azure RM provider um, installed. Uh, and we basically, what we will get after that is that we will get the information in the log file that, uh, that well, we get the hello from the, from uh, hello soft serve, right? Uh, one important thing is that Terraform by default does not uh, display the logs. So for this purpose, I have a well, very simple script, which basically just sets the two environment variables, the TF log info, which basically sets the, sets the information for the Terraform that, hey, please run all the, uh, please display all the logs uh, from the level of info and above to, to the log path. And the log path, which basically is the same directory that we have here, just for the purpose of uh, having the same file appear here in the, Terraform after after executing that code. So, so if I will run that code, you can see that once again I get the information that the overrides are in effect, uh, and the log starts to occur. Um, and even before we will run the whole apply, because this is running the apply. Uh, usually, the first step that happens is that Terraform checks the state or checks the currently existing uh, currently existing resources and provides us with some kind of difference. What is the current state and what will happen after afterwards? Uh, and for this per perspective, for this purpose, uh, basically the provider runs quite a lot of read operations. So after this one is being run properly, we should get the information in the log already that 
uh, that hello hello from the read message. And let's see if we have it already or not. No, okay, it's refreshing state. So now it's checking checking the state of how how the current uh, resource group exists. Okay, and we have some information that uh, we we don't have that resource group in place, so it can be created. So let's just put no for the moment. And if we will go now to the uh, to the log from this one, you can see that we have that first information hello source from read method, right? Which sometimes stamp when it appeared. Uh, there are of course other stuff also because the info is one of the most uh, most verbose one, where so it will write quite a lot of different stuff. Um, but basically, uh, it already, as you can see, displays some of the code that I have prepared for, for this presentation. So going back quickly to the main presentation once again. Uh, let's go over that resource group code example. Um, so of course, I will show that once again in the moment in the, um, in the, in the code itself. But uh, what the what the basically is a single file that contains the logic for providing the resource group type of resource contains. So first of all, you can see that on the very top of the screen, this is basically the, the constructor that contains all the information uh, of the setup. Uh, the first one is that we have the create, read, update, delete, and importer method on the very top. So basically, the, there we just provide information if we are running the specific operation, like the create or read or update, um, what kind of method should be run under the hood. So for this purpose, you can see we have the resource group create update, resource group read, etc. Uh, so those are the methods that are available much lower in the in the code, which are not currently available on the screen. I will show them in the moment. Uh, then the second part, from, so the lines from 38 to 43, you have the timeouts because each of the uh, each of the operations also should have different timeouts, so you can also provide it here. Uh, and then from the line 44 to 58, uh, there is the schema. Of course, the schema is much bigger for the more complex resources, but basically here you can you can write some kind of uh, information. Okay, what kind of parameters should, should your own resource that you are creating uh, prepare? Mm. Okay, and I guess we can go now to the second demo. So let's go a little bit more into those uh, create, read, delete methods. So going back here. Uh, as I mentioned, you can see from the very top, we start from the import. So basically all the different libraries that are being used are declared here, uh, which is also a little bit funny because some of them are already uh, deprecated and you get the information directly which is, uh, well, a little bit worrying always that uh, we are working on something that used the, the, the deprecated values, but well, it is what it is. Uh, then we have the, that main function that creates the resource resource group. Uh, and this is the code that I actually showed you in the on the presentation in, in the moment be before. And then we have four different methods. Actually, we have two, three methods. So the first one as for create and update is the same one. Um, yeah, here we have hello saucer from create method. Uh, in the meantime, just, just as a small off topic, you can see that the whole make build is still running. So it's not, not a quick process, but I leave it here just so you know, so you will see that it's uh, running somewhere in the background. Um, and what it does under the hood is actually, it starts from retrieving the client. So for this purpose, we have the resource groups client, um, which is available also as some kind of wrapper. So basically this is just some code that is responsible for creating the, the client, which under the hoods use different APIs. And for this specific purpose, uh, the groups client uses the resource group, groups client, uh, which is, as you can see, uh, running the Azure Go Auto, Auto REST Azure. So basically all the REST comments for the Azure API uh, and this one is actually responsible for all the all the logic that happens under the hood. So here you can see what kind of headers we are preparing, what kind of base URL, and what kind of parameters. Uh, and you can see all the complex methods, like for example, create or update happening here. So the rest of it, the two two previously shown. Uh, 
code files are mostly just the wrappers for what's happening under here. And if you go directly here, you can see that this code is actually not part of the Terraform provider itself, but it's part of the Azure SDK for Go. So this is just a third party library that is being loaded by the, by the Terraform provider itself. Uh, so going back here uh, for the create update, you can see that uh, we are basically trying to get on the very beginning the, uh, the name and, and see if this is the new resource, if we know that already, uh, and we, we know that it's, it, we can get the existing ones. Um, and of course, if there is some error. Well, basically, it will crash itself, and which is also handled by the other part of the uh, of the uh, code. Uh, but basically, if it won't find it, then basically it runs the create or update method, which under the hood runs here that create or update method to uh, to send the API request to Azure to just uh, create the resource group itself, uh, and then. As the second part, it once again tries to get that specific resource group. So just to validate that it was created properly. Uh, and basically, uh, then it returns that resource group has been uh, read and created. Um, then we have the second methods, uh, resource group read. So as you saw already from the execution previously, even when we are running apply, the first step is to verify what we already have available in the cloud. So this method is almost always run when we run the apply. The create update is, that's not always the case. Um, and this basically just, uh, well, basically gets, retrieves all the, uh, parses the group ID, and based on that creates the, uh, the specific, specific resource and provides all the information about it uh, to the rest of the code. And of course, the third method delete is very, well, it's a little bit more complex, of course, because the you know the deletion is always more complex. Uh, well, it's in theory it's easy because you're just deleting everything, but basically you also need to do all the, the different checks to be sure that you are not breaking anything in the existing ecosystem. So running through the whole, uh, yeah, for example, here, from the very beginning here, you have information that if there are any resources in it, it should prevent deletion. Uh, so based on the, the different setup and all the different parameters, it will behave differently. Um, and there are also, of course, some, some additional functions that are just for uh, displaying the errors, uh, messages that are more human friendly to read. Uh, okay, so let's go back to the presentation. Okay, so we have we have the code. How we can debug it properly? So HashiCorp by itself by themselves suggests one of two versions: the log debugging. So this is I would say the more basic one, and this is the one you saw already on the previous uh, parts of the presentation. So basically, you are writing some additional messages in the logs, and based on that, you are trying to resolve what's happening or where you are in the code. Uh, and the second one is the, that would say the more professional one, but also unfortunately more complex one is to connect debugger to running Terraform instance. So there is a there is some documentation for how this how this should be done. You can do it by the VS Code, or there is the software called Delve that is available also on the HashiCorp website. Uh, well, the documentation for it is available on the on the website, not the Delve itself. Uh, which basically allows you to connect to the uh, to the provider itself and then work with it. Uh, there are two tricky parts. The first one is that if you will just set the debugger to the uh, provider itself, uh, it won't work that well because then you can only run the debugs for the uh, for the auto, auto acceptance tests that are running as part of the of the compilation of the provider. Uh, if you would like to verify it in your own uh, Terraform code, basically what you need to do is you need to run the Terraform init apply or any of the other methods that will basically execute the code that you are interested in. Uh, and then you would need to find the proper ID of the process that you're running and connect that compiler to the, uh, connect that debugger to the specific ID for the process. So as I said, setup is much more complex. It's of course it's available. So if if you have very complex uh, issue, this is also the way to go. But uh, for the simpler one, when well, you know that there is the, the issue shouldn't be that complex, probably the log debugging would be the the simple one for you. Uh, and then 
you can we can start with preparing the provider for usage, right? So if we are working with some with our custom version of the provider or we are preparing our own providers, uh, we have some some different ways how we can uh, make it available for our users. Uh, so first of all is of course to host it somewhere within your company. So this can be storage account, this can be S3 or this can be some shared drive, for example, and reference this file directly. And uh, of course, this is, this is a way, I would say it's probably not the best, but uh, if you don't use the Terraform uh, enterprise, uh, which you can see as the second solution here, uh, probably that's the best, best approach that you can have at the current moment. Uh, the, so the second one is to use the Terraform enterprise. Uh, if you, you use Terraform Cloud, uh, you can use the Terraform Cloud module registry, which basically allows you to connect your very your specific Git repository uh, to the uh, to the cloud uh, module registry, and then uh, Terraform Enterprise will basically load by itself the content of the specific uh, provider and prepare everything to have it working properly. Uh, the only tricky part is that you need to also prepare your own version of the provider. So in this case, you need to provide the uh, at least three points, uh, three digits uh, version. So X, Y, Z in this case, uh, three values separated by two dots, because if that's not the case, uh, Terraform uh, Cloud Module Registry would just say, hey, you are not meeting our versioning schema requirements and we are not able to process your provider by itself. Uh, and then of course, how we can use it. So we, we simply need to provide it as the, Azure RM, for example, module. Uh, we need to provide the source for it uh, by the specific uh, specific uh, parameter. Uh, but also, we need to configure the credentials to be used because, of course, if we are using the private module registry, then uh, it's not available publicly. So we also need to retrieve the uh, API token from the Terraform cloud uh, and point it to the Terraform configuration. Uh, okay, and we have it. So what can we do with the changes that we have provided? Of course, first of all, if we are working with some uh, external uh, provider that is available, that was created by someone else, we should contribute back to main repository. Uh, having, you know, having the issue fixed on our own is a good thing, but it would be even better if we won't have to maintain that, that custom version of the provider that we have prepared for the rest uh, time of the project but basically just provide some kind of proper pull request, uh, work with the, with the uh, contributors and maintainers of the repository to be sure that it is somehow included in the upcoming releases. And my suggestion would be that after that release has been provided, uh, clean up your own tooling, do not use the custom module anymore if it's not no longer necessary uh, and go further with using the properly fixed official version. Uh, and of course, then you can also call yourself an open source contributor and pat yourself on the back. Um, and when you have that kind of experience, you can also start writing your own providers for some smaller stuff. Uh, for example, one of the customers that I am currently working with uh, has their own um, internal tooling because every, every big company loves their own internal toolings. Uh, and as they are also working with the Terraform, they have prepared also their own provider, which they are working with. Uh, and we, as part of the DevOps team, are currently obliged to also use it to some degree. So that also includes us, as well, makes us some required for us to basically also sometimes update that specific provider to be sure that it works properly for our, our needs. OK, and thank you for listening. Uh, are there any questions? Thank you, Michal. Guys, if uh, everyone, uh, um, uh, anyone has any questions, please unmute and ask or just use chat.